Coming up, if your kids keep asking for a pony, maybe the Great Dane is the next best thing. If your cat goes on the attack, could you be the reason why? A shy and skittish dog calms down with the help of a lawn chair. And what you feed your kitten now can shape the adult cat she'll become. All this plus puppy kindergarten class with our pet trainer 911 next on Animal Attractions TV. Have you always wanted a pony? Or do your kids constantly hound you to get them one? Well, a giant dog like Zephyr here could be the perfect compromise. But you need to realize there are many misconceptions that come along with this breed. So we're gonna reveal some qualities of the Great Dane that might just have you start thinking, this is the perfect match for me. Here, watch this. The funniest thing about taking Zulu out in public is people uh, will always come up to us and say, hey, can we put a saddle on him? And uh, we've heard it every time we've taken him out. Or, uh, man, that's a baby horse. Zulu is a big baby. He's big, but he acts like he's a little dog. Well, he thinks he's a lap dog, most definitely, but he obviously isn't. He's definitely a mama's boy. Probably has something to do with it. He was a gift to me about five years ago for Valentine's Day, actually. From an early age, we trained Zulu to be very friendly around people, and uh, my wife and I have uh, lots of nieces and nephews, so he's really good around kids. He loves to be around people, um, and he's great with kids. Um, they call him the gentle giants. They actually say they're really great, like apartment dogs, because they don't need the exercise that like a Labrador would need, but he will let you know when he's ready to have some exercise, go to the beach, or take a car ride or something. If you're looking to purchase a Great Dane, make sure you're the type of family that's ready for a dog of this size. Obviously, it takes lots of space, a lot of room. They're a very sensitive dog, and they need lots and lots of attention. So make sure you look into this before you make that purchase. <laughs> this is a breed that you definitely can't leave outside. And especially if you live in the north, they do not do very well in the cold weather. So never plan on keeping a dog like this outside when it is getting cold. It's also a dog as a puppy that if you have lots of landscaping, they're probably going to do a lot of damage to it. They love to dig, and it's something that if you want to keep a lot of landscaping around, you better not do it when you have a young puppy Great Dane around. When Chris gave him to me for Valentine's Day about five years ago, he was only 13 pounds. He was teeny tiny. So, but obviously quickly within the first year, he got up to actually about 176. And the vet said, he's getting a little big. You guys need to tone the food down. So we did, and he lost a little bit of weight. Um, sometimes you do hear about the Great Danes um, with their health issues. Their lifespan isn't as long as some other dogs. Um, however, we've been pretty fortunate with Zulu. Um, we've just had a, a couple scares that he had the bloat, and it's probably just more our nerves than anything else. One disease that you're going to see in Great Danes is bloating. And bloating is a condition where the stomach and the intestines twist on themselves. Once this condition starts, you're looking at a very serious condition, which you need to get to a veterinarian immediately because these dogs can actually die in two to three hours. Something else you need to be concerned about is wobbler's disease, which is a disease of the vertebrae in the neck, and also hip dysplasia, which is an issue with the uh, hips in these large breed dogs. With proper breeding and good quality breeders, you can avoid most of these type of situations. Believe it or not, um, Great Danes are not uh, expensive to feed. They actually only eat six cups a day, which is more than most dogs, but at the same time, people think they eat tons and tons of food every day. He gets three cups of food in the morning and three cups in the evening. A uh, dog this size has to be, you can't feed him on the floor like most dogs. You have to, uh, since he is a lot taller than most dogs, we have to have a raised feeding dish for him. Otherwise, if he's leaning down and eating, he'll, he'll choke on the food. Zulu is just the best dog, you know? He's always there for you. He's just right there with his same old happy personality. As long as he gets a walk and gets food, he's happy to go. Your idea and your cat's idea of the perfect scratching post might be two different things. And if you're smart, you'll go with your cat's preference.
Scratching is a natural part of cat behavior and they actually use it to mark their territory. So if you have a post and your cat isn't using it anymore, before you go out and buy a new one, here's some ideas to refurbish your old one and save you some money. First of all, the perfect scratching post should be about 24 to 28 inches high so your cat can fully stretch out when he scratches on it. I've already removed all the material off this post and it was originally covered with a sisal rope, which cats love. Now I could have recovered it with more sisal rope, but instead I'm trying a different material. Cats love the back of carpeting, so I'm going to use this carpet remnant. I've already cut it to size with a utility knife and I'm going to double check that it's the right size and it's perfect. So then what I'm going to do is put some glue on the post with just some construction glue. And you start at the top and make it go down to the bottom and go on the other side, start at the top and squeeze it down to the bottom. Good. And then you apply an ample amount of construction glue to the carpet. Go back and forth. Once you have the glue on your carpet, you put it in position on the post. Make sure you have it just where you want it. And this is where your little piece of tape comes in. You use your duct tape to secure it while you fasten it tight. Good. Now, you take your piece of string and tie a little loop in the end, like this. Loop it around and then loop the string through the loop. This is going to give you a very secure anchor at the top. Bring the carpet all the way to the top and then pull it tight, tight, tight. That's the secret. Loop it around, make sure your carpet is straight, and pull it very, very tight all the way to the bottom. Boom. And that's good enough to hold it until it dries. Then you can finish it off by putting some sisal rope along the top and it looks great. Now, let it dry for 24 hours outside the house so your cat won't associate the glue smell with this. And you can replace that smell with some catnip and your own scent. When it's ready, just rub your hands and the catnip all over it. Then your cat will have a brand new, wonderful scratching post. Probably the reason we think dogs are our best friends is because they are so easy to get along with. But every once in a while, things go wrong. And when they do, it's hard to know what to do. That's when we call our pet trainer 911. Ah, retirement. Golden years of peace, leisure, and tranquility. Except for one tiny wrinkle. Justin. I did notice uh, a timidity about him from day one. Justin started out a very nervous dog and a dog that wanted to pull our arms out of our sockets. Well, recently we moved to a retirement area that we love very much, but we noticed that <clears throat> when people did come into our home, it would become very nervous. He would run around the house, not wanting to come close to the person, but then sneaking up, and the person would see Justin, and Justin would turn around and run back around the table or around us and hide behind Diane or myself. Justin, come here. Come on, don't hide. Come here, boy. I was truly frightened that I couldn't control the dog. I fear for him harming another human or dog because of the behavior that he exhibits when I'm out walking him on leash. She has a bad shoulder now, and she almost fell a couple times. She called our vet, and our vet recommended Ron. Uh, most people think when they come up on a dog and he bags away or he runs behind the owner that he's been abused. But no, he's just not used to people. It's how you raise him if you don't socialize him. All dogs need to be socialized. If you don't socialize him, you got a fearful dog. How you doing? So they told me that the dog never went out the front door. He would only go out the back door, and when company comes over, they would put him away. What are we going to do with your dog since he's so nervous, and it seems like your wife is very nervous with the dog, so it makes the dog nervous. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? I'm going to work with you two 
to build up your dog's confidence and yours too. When I met the dog and the owners, I knew right off the top that I couldn't take this dog home because I knew he, he would probably, the dog would probably have a nervous breakdown. Great. So I'm gonna come to your house and work with you here every day. So what we're gonna do when we get up here, there, oh, there's some kids. And if the kids come over and pet the dog, let them pet the dog. I told them not to pull the dog back when kids come up on the dog. And they come up and they pet the dog, but don't you talk to him. Cause she was used to saying, Justin, everything is fine. She was catering to him. She was building fear in the dog. Leave it, leave it, leave it, leave it. Yeah, get on him. Get Somebody on him. has to be a strong dog on this walk. And that made the dog get his confidence built up and hers too. Something like that would have happened. He would have took and attacked the dog. Mm -hmm. You would snatch the collar okay. and tell him to leave it to make him feel you because you have to get involved in the fight. So what I did, I took him back to basic training. I wanted to give them some structure and to show them that they need to start off with making this dog sit, down, stay, and telling this dog what to do. You told me when the doorbell rings or when they knock, he just barks excessively. So what we're gonna do is, you're gonna go to the door with your dog, and you're gonna see who it is, and you're gonna pull it and tell him quiet. So he's gonna learn the word quiet, and you're gonna let your neighbor come in, you're gonna bring your dog in, you and your neighbor, and you're gonna stop over there by that rug and make your dog sit down and stay, and you come back over and have a conversation with your neighbor. We are working at it. You're seeing a transformed dog in our neighborhood, aren't you? Now, now what we do, your dog got up, so you will put him right back there, because he's come to hide behind you, and we want him to know that he don't need to be there. You can handle this. Heel. Sit. Down. Stay. And then when you're, when you're done talking, when your neighbor gets done, you would just have your neighbor walk right past your dog and go out the door. Okay. Here we go. Good luck, Charlie. And then when your neighbor leaves, do not appraise the dog because you want this to be the norm because you want to get this comfort level in this house with that dog. Go right in here. Once we trained them their basic commands, now I needed to bring her out into the world and get this dog used to it. So we went to some of the pet stores to let her dog hear the different noises where he can get used to it. So I would take a chair and tell her to make him sit down and stay and I would just gradually just drop it and I knew that he was going to jump up so I had her put him back there and then when stay. she said stay I would drop it and then if he got up she'd tell him to sit down and stay and I would drop it then eventually he wouldn't even get up through a very short time with working with Ron Justin has made an amazing turnabout keeping consistent with people noise, take him around other dogs, or riding in the car, take him into different stores, go sit outside of a restaurant. We are now a family. We can be together calmly, have people over. We can walk, take our long walks, and not be frightened on what we're gonna encounter along the way and how to handle it. She was telling me things that she has did with that dog that she has never did before and I knew that my job was over with. Justin has become a lot calmer and a lot happier dog. That's the key, happier. Fun-loving, mysterious, inquisitive, and entertaining. Did we mention they're great companions? If you love felines, you know we're bragging about cats, and that when you live with one, you're bound to have a bit of cat trouble. But no need to let them drive you crazy. Just ask, what would Roger Tabor do? He's the world's leading authority on cats, and he's here to help. We get emails that come into the program, and I've got one here, it's from Phyllis. She's got a Jekyll and Hyde cat. One minute it's lying there, all is perfectly quiet and calm. The next minute it's kicking her forearm, it's got its paws around there, and it's biting like mad into her hand. Is it schizophrenic, she says? <laughs> schizophrenic? No. <laughs> All that's going on with this rough house play is that the excitement levels of your cat has changed. And people don't realize very often that they're doing it. You can over 
excite a cat by just doing something like this too much and the cat gets much more up for it and heightened and then suddenly goes into an attack mode and it's part biting as it would with another cat and then kicking. The kicking ants here is what two cats do naturally when they're fighting. And really, you don't want your cat fighting against your arm. So how can you stop it? Well, it's fairly straightforward. All you have to do is pretty much stand up because you can anticipate what's going to happen. You can see the mood because you're familiar with your cat, what it's likely to do. And you can just stand up and avoid it. And that's the end of the problem. Well, Stan has written in on an email from Detroit and says, can I let my cat outside? Is it safe to let my cat outside? Nobody would have asked that question 25 years ago. All cats pretty much in that time were indoor, outdoor cats. And you had a cat flap and you allowed them out, or you had a door and you allowed them out. And if you think about it, for three and a half thousand years minimum, cats have wandered wherever they wish to just like you, I'm wondering up on my shoulder, aren't you? <laughs> yes, little tinker. Um, and when you've got that going on, it's so entertaining for the cat. They like climbing, they like clambering, they like doing all sorts of stuff. You take them inside and you lose all of that. So for me, I would never have a confined cat. Me, personally, I always would have an indoor, outdoor cat because of that vitality. And I know that people are worried about accidents with vehicles. Yes, there is traffic risk, and you have to evaluate that in the own area where you live. But I do hear people say, Roger, I live in an apartment, what can I do? Well, if you are in a high rise, are in an apartment, and you want a cat, yes, of course, you can make it more like the outside world. Put in retreat places, put in shelving that they can go up on, make it an exciting, enjoyable place for them. And then it's less of a stressful issue because as you see, cats like getting up. One glance at this sweet little face and we are hooked. Love at first sight. If you've ever adopted a kitten into your family, you know exactly what I mean. They are easy care, wonderful pets with amazing abilities. Did you know a healthy cat can jump several times higher than her body length, sprint at about 31 miles per hour, and see six times better than we can in the dark? And look at these ears. More than 30 muscles control the action of her outer ear alone. Meaning at her best, this kitten will be able to turn her ears to the direction of sound 10 times faster than the best watchdog and hear three times better than we do. Ears also play a role in balance to help her land on her feet, but it'll take the right nutrition at the right window of time to fully refine these superpowers. So when is this critical window of time? It's your kitten's first year of life. It's called the growth phase. So much is happening those first 12 months. The brain and eyes are developing, vital organs, the immune system. And if she's healthy, her energy level is off the charts. At the very least, you're gonna to wanna to feed your kitten a high quality kitten food that contains optimal nutrition for this important life stage. Veterinarians will often recommend a clinically proven premium food formulated for kittens only, not based on size or breed, but their age for higher fat and calorie needs. And be sure to check out the nutrients on the package. Look for taurine. That's an essential amino acid for a strong heart. It also benefits the development of your kitten's keen vision. Clinically proven antioxidants, vitamin E plus C, help build a healthy immune system. DHA and EPA are omega-3 fatty acids that are found in high quality fish oils. They promote a healthy brain and eyes. For building lean muscles and to help your kitten achieve his ideal body weight, high quality proteins are key. And when the high quality ingredients include gentle fibers for high digestibility, it means your kitten will put more of what he eats to good use throughout his body, leaving less to go out. Translation, less litter box cleanup. Who wouldn't want that? And, and this is very important, once your kitten reaches 12 months of age, never feed her a kitten food. She needs to be transitioned to an adult food that better meets her lower energy requirements. Don't worry. If you provide the right nutrition during kittenhood, 
your cat will have plenty of energy as an adult. In fact, many cats remain playful throughout their entire lives. And with all her superpowers in full gear, just continue feeding her high quality food and then just sit back and enjoy the show. Are you one of the millions of people expecting a new member of the family? The furry kind with four paws and a face that melts your heart? In other words, are you getting a puppy? Well, we're here to help with a series of tips and techniques to guide you both through your puppy's first 12 months. A trained dog is a happy dog. One of the biggest mistakes a dog owner can make is to not train his dog. Coach Ronald White is constantly being called in to fix problems with dogs who are on the verge of being sent away permanently. And many of these circumstances could have been prevented. How? By starting training early on. By training your dog right away, it provides a lot of fun for you and your puppy, and it also creates a great bonding experience. Your puppy sees you as his leader, and you get to experience the benefits of a socialized and well-adjusted dog. It's never too early to start training your dog. Just make it a lot of fun, games, and plenty of treats. And break the treats up into little small pieces because your dogs have little small teeth. I would recommend a, a little small collar for your dog, uh, like a nylon, and just make sure it fits him and let him get used to wearing it. It has to be snug, but not tight. You put your finger up under it and go around his neck and see if he have room or try to pull it over his head. And if it comes off, it's too loose. Don't take it off of him. Let him get used to it, because if you take it off of him, well then he knows if he scratches or barks or whines, you'll take it off. So let him get used to it. He's never had one on. Once he's used to wearing the collar, I'll introduce him to the leash and I'll snap the leash on him and let him drag the leash around for a few minutes. Then I'll tie him up where he can get used to pulling. Therefore, when I take him for a walk, he'll be pulling me, he won't be biting at the leash, and he'll get used to wearing the collar and the leash dragging it. So once we train the dog to get used to the collar and the leash, now it's time to train the dog, come here for when you're walking him. We will let him stretch the lead out and call him, come here and then give him a treat. Come here. And just be consistent of calling him, come here, treat, and then he picks that command up, come, come here. here. And he'd come, come right to you. Then I taught him how to sit. I would take the treat, come here. and he would look at me, and I'll put it right up over his head, and it makes him raise his head up, and he, he sits down, and then I reward him for what he did, and the dog picks it right up. When I train him to down, sit. I'll make him sit, okay and then stay and then go back to his side and then I'll drop the leash and I'll pull his feet out from under him and I'll push down on his back because I want to show him what I'm saying to him and he'll pick it right up and I'll give him a treat when he's down. He has to learn how to walk with me and not pull me. He'll know his place with me. It's very important how to hold the leash. You want to have your dog on the left side and you want to stand up tall have your hands hanging down, use a short lead. And when you start walking, say heel in a firm voice. And when he walks correctly with me, I'll give him a treat. I'll reward him. I want him to do it right because now he's old enough to learn. So as I'm training the dog and I tell him to sit and he don't want to sit, I won't give him the treat. Or if he sits and then he downs, I won't give him the treat either. So what I'll do, I'll start him over again and I'll tell him to down. If he down, I gave him a treat. But if he rolls over, I'll start him over. Don't get upset with your dog if he doesn't do it right every time. But just be patient and work with him and you'll see the older he gets, the better it's gonna get. So remember to keep it fun. This is just bonding, play, love, and he's just a puppy. And you'll see, you have a great dog in the end. Do you realize that your pet's normal body temperature is 101 degrees? And what's surprising and alarming is that if its core body temperature increases by just 2%, it creates hyperthermia, also called heat stroke. Now, we all know that a pet inside a hot car is a very dangerous thing. Pets can overheat much quicker than we think. But 
Let me give you an example of how bad it can be. Let's say this car is parked in the shade, windows crack just a little bit, outside temperature is 78 degrees, inside that car it can become 90 degrees within minutes. So you can imagine how unbearable it will be for that pet during those hot summer days. Some other situations that you may not associate with overheating can be fatal to your pet, such as leaving your pet in a yard on a hot day without access to shade or water, and excessive or vigorous exercise or long walks when it's hot. Dogs have only a small number of sweat glands in their foot pads, so they can't perspire like we do. Have you ever heard the expression, no muzzle while grooming? That can be very risky. Well, the reason why that is is because a dog cools itself down when it starts panting. It's the evaporation off his tongue that actually does that. And when a muzzle is on him, it's very difficult to cool down. Another one is prolonged exposure to a hair dryer. Even professional groomers have to be watchful for signs of overheating. Short-nosed breeds like pugs, bulldogs, boxers, and Persian cats are already predisposed towards overheating, so take extreme care with these pets on a warm day. Bring fresh water anywhere you bring your pet. If your dog happens to overheat, do not attempt to cool him down quickly. This needs to be a gradual process where you could actually cause more harm than good. Most of all, call your veterinarian right away. Even if your pet recovers normally, it's important to have them checked out. All right, that's our show for today. If you want any more information on this, check out our website at animalattractionstv.com. You'll find some surprising symptoms in overheating right there. All right, I'm Alex Boylan. See you next time. Let's go, family. <laughs>